they don't come here to attack us because we're rich and we're free. They come and they, and they attack us because we're over there. We don't need to go populist left or populist right. We don't need to embrace neo-Marxism or neo-fascism, these disastrous movements from the 20th century. Turns out the answer is pretty much our Bill of Rights. Our story. Embrace freedom. That's the answer. And if the LP has a purpose, it's not to put people to sleep. It's to wake them up. We're here because we love liberty. And we're here because we hate injustice. We are here to save mankind. We are here to fight. Join us, the Libertarian Party, in perhaps the most exciting, grandest endeavor in history, the restoration of American liberty. Ideas spread, they can't stop them. An idea whose time has come cannot be stopped by any army or any government. Hello and welcome to episode 86 of Decentralized Revolution, a podcast from the Libertarian Party Mises Caucus and Mises PAC. I'm Aaron Harris and I'm your host, my guest today is uh, really one of the great libertarian thinkers, I think, of uh, our uh, lifetime, uh, the past generation or so, uh, especially in his area of expertise, and that's intellectual property and kind of the libertarian, uh, the proper libertarian anarcho-capitalist theoretical take uh, on that, which uh, really, uh, I think, is a really key issue that... Uh, IP laws have a, a much greater impact on uh, day-to-day life and uh, uh, other areas uh, of uh, that, that affect liberty than we really know. And of course, I'm talking about Stefan Kinsella. Uh, he was my guest on episode 46 here of Decentralized Revolution. Um, you want to go back and listen to that. That's where we talk about his uh, kind of his whole take on intellectual property. He wrote a a little, uh, a little book. It's a short book, but uh, a, an incredibly important one. I think if I were, you know, recommending, you know, we had 10 books to like rewrite uh, uh, the basis of uh, 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 legal order uh, in uh, modern day America, I would definitely pick his book against intellectual property because it really lays out the um, everything about it, the correct libertarian take. And I highly recommend you listen to that. And go back and listen to episode 46 of Decentralized Revolution. I'll have a link to that on uh, the show notes page for this episode at decentralizedrevolution.com slash 87. But the reason I had Stefan on uh, today uh, is to talk about a recent post he made uh, on his blog about uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, more specifically uh, a lot of the uh, libertarian critics of Hoppe, um, as you know, especially uh, in the last couple of years with the rise of the Mises Caucus, there are a lot of people within the Libertarian Party and the Libertarian world who um, are looking at ways to get at uh, the Mises Caucus. They don't like the direction uh, that we've taken the party and uh, that, you know, they think we're ruining uh, the perception of libertarianism, uh, which, uh, you know, if I were them, I'd maybe look at uh, uh, a mirror um, in regard to um, uh, what's gone on the last 20 years or so. But uh, uh, so they don't have a lot of substantive critiques or, you know, accomplishments of their own to point to. Uh, so they're looking at ways to tear down uh, the new approach uh, that the Mises Caucus has brought to things. And of course, one of that, uh, one of the core elements of that is our focus on political decentralization, which is uh, in contrast to I think what the LP has gone for uh, through most of its fifty years is kind of a libertarian universalism uh, in thinking. Okay, let's you know let's win the presidency and then we'll can you know convince everybody that uh, menarche or ANCAP uh, uh, philosophy is correct. And then we'll, you know, go, go ahead and dismantle the state after we've uh, taken it over in its present form. I, I think there's a lot of uh, problems with that, obviously. And the uh, approach of decentralization is kind of splitting up political power uh, instead of, you know, a, you know, say what, what are there now a hundred some 
uh, states in the world, uh, it would be far better if we had a thousand or if we had 10,000. And so moving in that direction is moving more toward intellectual or sorry, individual governance uh, that we libertarians favor. So, you know, there's a there's a big debate to be had over that, though. I mean, there's not uh, it's not a magic bullet. Uh, The other side has some uh, good points, but they don't want to have that discussion. They want to just kind of uh, tear down and poison the well, muddy the waters. And one way they've done that is to, you know, go off with some pretty unhinged uh, takes on Hans Hermann Hoppe, uh, because his book, uh, uh, Democracy, the God that Failed, and other writings of his uh, really uh, kind of show uh, the theoretical advantages and the practical advantages of, of going toward uh, decentralization. Um, and so he he writes in a way, and, and Stefan Kinsella gets into this, that, uh, you know, he's very declarative and uh, has opinions. And if you take some of his uh, passages out of context, or you, um, you know, kind of summarize his views on some issues, uh, it does sound kind of weird uh, from a libertarian perspective, especially um where you come from in the libertarian world. So the important thing is, is to sort out what's true and what's not to actually look at what Hoppe has written and what he believes. And, uh, uh, so Kinsella kind of points that out and points out some of the, uh, unfounded nature of the attacks on Hoppe and his, uh, reputation, uh, specifically, uh, there were some posts on social media, by uh, uh, an academic historian. Uh, I don't know if he's an academic. He's at a, a think tank at AEIR, I think. Uh, but he is an economic historian. And uh, his name is Phil Magnus. And uh, Stefan has a lot of nice things to say about him outside his um, unhinged uh, critique of Hoppe, which includes basically branding him as a Nazi sympathizer, which, you know, once you kind of go that far, you better have some clear evidence and not just sort of insinuation and deduction. And uh, uh, Stefan's article kind of points out that uh, Magnus and other people who accuse Hoppe of that sort of thing simply don't have that sort of documentation. So we go into that. uh, We talk about the article. We talk about what Hoppe actually believes on um, uh, issues like monarchy and um, uh, immigration and uh, Stefan is, you know, he's worked with Hoppe. He knows him well. Uh, as you listen to this, uh, as this uh, podcast episode posts, uh, uh, Stefan is over in Turkey at uh, uh, Hoppe's Property and Freedom event. So uh, uh, Kinsella is, you know, one of the handful of people I think most qualified to actually um, outline what Hoppe believes. And so we get into all of that. And I always enjoy spending time with uh, Stefan Kinsella, and I'm sure you will too. A theme uh, uh, since the Mises Caucus kind of got up and going uh, that, you know, people find ways to criticize us. And one of those is uh, Hoppe and, and things that people uh, attribute to him. And, and you just uh, uh, published an article on your blog uh, just within the last several days uh, that I thought, you know, who better to talk about Hoppe than Stefan Kinsella? So tell us, you know, what prompted you to, to uh, write the article and what the what its thrust is? I mean, well, Hoppe would be better to talk about it, but he doesn't do a lot of interviews. So. Yeah. If, if, <laughs> if when thing. when next time you see him, uh, tell him I'd love to have him on. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a, obviously I'm a follower and a supporter and a friend of Hans for quite a long time. Um, in fact, I'll I'll play you. A... Oh, never mind. I, I have, my ringtone is uh, Hoppe saying crusty anti-fascist, crusty anti-fascist mob. <laughs> <laughs> well, see right there, you 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 prove that we're uh, we're fascists because we're right, the right because, Yeah, but, but but because when a group calls themselves Antifa, that means that they're really anti-fascist. You have to take them for their word, right? Right, and even if they, yeah, even if they actually do hate fascists, which you know, whatever. But oh, so if you just if you just pick the right name for your group, then no one can oppose <laughs> you without being a bigot or whatever. Right. So, yes. Yeah, St- um, St- last I checked, Stalin was uh, anti-fascist too. So it's, it's just it's just like uh, the Inflation Reduction Act that I think is passing today, being signed today. 
into law, that's actually going to reduce inflation because after all, it's in the goddamn name of it. Right. You know? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So anti-fascists are really libertarians. And if you're against them, you, then you're a fascist, I guess. Right. So, right. Oh, well, um, we, we've settled that. So, yeah. no, so um, get into so your article I, there. Listen, I've been, uh, I've been an admirer of Hoppe's since say 1988, when I first read his argumentation ethics article in Liberty magazine, when I was a, a young pup in law school. And then I became friends with him in 94, and I've been closely associated with him ever since. Um, I've always been mystified by the hate that that some people throw at him. Um, I, I think there's a variety of reasons, professional jealousy, uh, a different a different approach, you know, defending your turf, uh, you know. But um, maybe his style of presentation is too curt for them or something. I don't know, but um, maybe he's German. Yep. <laughs> but um, – my main interest in Hans always was his first his first period of writing, like uh, the theory of socialism and capitalism and the stuff up until um, he turned more to its cultural matters like immigration and monarchy and th things like that in his democracy book and other things. And I think most of his critics seem not to have read his earlier stuff, and they just they just focus on the the the, the few cultural conserv culturally conservative, you know, lines and, and thoughts he, he puts in his later stuff. Um, and, but, and let me point out that it's not, uh, you know, a lot of these criticisms of him, I think are exactly that, but they're divorced even not only from the context of his entire career, but they're divorced from the context of the works from which they take those. Oh yeah. Snippets. They, they, they take it out of context. Um, um, you know, he, he had this controversial thing back in the nineties, I want to say, he was at UNLV, an economics professor, and he used the example. He was trying to explain time preference to his students. And so he he said something like, you know, um, people with children tend to have a higher, a lower time preference because the, the, their values change. They start valuing their kids' lives, and that's further down the road. So it makes them naturally have a lower time preference. So homosexuals who don't tend to have children as much would tend to have a higher time preference. It was simply an example. I don't even know if I agree with it, but – it was just an example, like to get you thinking. And of course, right. one student raised a ruckus, and he had to fight off the thought police, and he won. Actually, um, maybe he wouldn't today if things weren't quite as bad back then. But um, um, yeah, so Phil Magnus, who um, who you know, I've enjoyed a lot of his uh, his thought and his 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 writing and his, his some of his uh, appearances on the Tom Woods show. But he, you know, he started kind of going after Hans a while back, Hans Hoppe. Um, the first thing was that back in 2019, he started just attacking Hans left and right. And by the way, I'm used to – we're used to the left libertarians attacking Hoppe, um, you know, uh, the Jason Brennan types and the, you know, the, uh, all these guys, you know, the, the, right. the, the George Mason guys, the, the Cato guys, the Coke yeah. guys. But um, – it was kind of surprising that that uh, Magnus would do that. So his first his first critique was this what I thought was a bizarre kind of academic argument that Hoppe's immigration views, which which are nuanced and complicated, and I yeah. find them fascinating, but they've generated a lot of controversy. But his immigration views and what Magnus I think talks about his racial racial views um, are heavily influenced by the Frankfurt School and by his. PhD advisor Jürgen Habermas, who's a social democrat, a famous social democrat philosopher in Europe, um, and I think I just think there's like literally no evidence for that. And in fact, I've asked Hoppe, and Hans is like, no, I don't. <laughs> nothing I ever said was influenced by that stuff at all. Um, I don't think he's um, he's influenced by Habermas at all, except in a narrow way in his argumentation ethics, which he concedes. Um, but he basically just took. Kind of a core insight of Habermas and Appel about discourse ethics, and he he used that combined with praxeology and, and and radical libertarian political analysis and Austrian economics to come up with a, a libertarian a defense of libertarian uh, ethics and libertarian rights. So yeah, Habermas influenced him there, but that's about it. So I thought it was an odd way to start criticizing Hans is just saying that he was. I have a feeling that um, that. Um, uh, Magnus has been influenced by this uh, philosopher Quinn Slobodian, and you know some kind of complicated, convoluted views about the, the evil influence of Hayek and Habermas and all this stuff. Um, 
let, let's let me ask you a quick question to, for, for those who don't know Phil Magnus. Uh, and, and this isn't going to be a, you know, a pile on Phil Magnus, but just to the context of the article, who who is he? You know, I don't really I don't really remember. who. I think he's a professor somewhere. Um, I'm friends with him on Facebook. I've always liked him. Um, we're still friends. Um, I'm, I don't want to pile on the guy. I just disagree with him. I, I disagree right. with his accusations and the most recent accusation is that hoppe is a nazi sympathizer he literally said hop was a nazi sympathizer right i mean it, it's not just he's influenced balefully by habermas it's oh no he's a nazi sympathizer um let's see i think he's a professor somewhere oh let me see um i i, I can't check right well now. i that's all right i'll have info um, I'll look it up here in a second, but uh, there will be info on. Oh, no, he's not. He's not a professor. I'm sorry. I, I'm forgetting. I think he's not a professor. He's not on the academic track. I think he is. His main job is at AIE, AIER, okay. American Institute for Economic Research. Yeah. yeah just, no, that, that, actually, that, yeah, I was confusing people. Um, that was part of my whole thesis is like just guessing. I'm not a conspiracy theorist usually, but I was just guessing why might he, he be amping up his attacks on Hoppe going from this kind of abstruse, convoluted, Habermasian critique, which no one even knows what he's talking about, so it, it won't right. hit home to saying he's a Nazi sympathizer just recently. And in January of this year, uh, the new uh, AIER, who's his employer, just a, appointed a brand new president. Okay. Uh, this guy, Will Ruger, who is a Coke, you know, he's a longtime Coke Foundation worker. So basically, a Charles Coke guy, a Cato guy. Is now in head of is now Phil's boss. So yeah. I was simply surmising, oh, maybe Phil kind of recognizes he's going to get some some attaboys. Well, th this is a good time to uh, for me to introduce a, a couple short paragraphs from your article that that I think kind of set the the tone. Um, and, and again, this will be linked to uh, on the show notes page, decentralizedrevolution.com slash eighty seven. Uh, from your article, this is you uh, writing, uh, no doubt the Coctopus and D.C. libertarians are very unhappy with the Mises Institute, Mises Caucus influence on and domination of the LP after the Reno reset last May. Until now, they could try to pretend the Mises Institute was a minor thorn in their side and ignore them. But now its intellectual influence is magnified and amplified greatly by the Mises Caucus takeover of the LP the nation's third largest political party. So is it implausible to believe that the DC libertarians want to destroy the Mises caucus in order to reinstall the moderate lockdown, obedient old guard in the LP and what better way to damage the Mises caucus than to try to discredit Hoppe, the most prominent intellectual associated with the Mises Institute. These flaccid attacks on Hoppe will no doubt fail all previous attempts to take him down have and one final thing of course caucus and institute are two totally separate uh organizations i'm always uh, uh want to point that out yeah they're separate and let me let me just add one thing so after i wrote this magnus wrote on facebook to me he said well he accused me of going nancy mclean conspiracy theorist uh, yeah. but i didn't really say it was true i simply said is it possible you know i mean there's nothing wrong with making a hypothesis and there's nothing wrong with psychologizing either, as long as you admit that it's psychologizing and yeah. you don't substitute that for uh, substantive um, argumentation or criticism. But he said, here's the Occam's razor explanation. In the last one to two weeks, the Libertarian Party social media stream has started aggressively pushing Hoppe as the philosophical lodestar of libertarianism. That in turn induced me to make the same exact criticisms of Hoppe that I have been pointing out for several years. OK, so first of all, that doesn't address what that doesn't really rebut what i argued i mean first of all why does he care about what the libertarian party is doing mm -hmm. it's because the it's because the the coke people care because it's a, it's a big voice of libertarianism and it's being influenced by and, and second of all i don't see them you know in the last few weeks worshiping hoppa they they wished him happy birthday basically on his birthday right okay yep. big deal <laughs> you know <laughs> so what <laughs> Right. And, and some of the other uh, I think some of the criticisms that go out is like when uh, the LP, uh, which, you know, Mises caucus members are running the, the social media page. Now, when we do come out taking positions on what they like to call culture war stuff, they automatically say, oh, it's it's hoppy and it's alt right. When, I, you know, I've always been of the uh, opinion that it's for, as libertarians, when we criticize 
uh, stuff. And I, I don't think that like the drag show thing has come up lately, but like, that's a classic uh, thing. It's like, well, we don't, it's not that we don't want people to be allowed to do those things. It's that the cultural and, you know, basically the state enables a lot of this stuff through subsidy and stuff like this. And it, you know, and the um, you know, the corporate media, you know, are telling us that this is normal and great and we should all support it. And so we're pushing back on state subsidy of this stuff and the, the cultural attitude that, you know, to somehow be tolerant, you have to like tolerate every single thing. And so I think it's interesting that, you know, the people uh, who criticize the Mises caucus are triggered by that sort of stuff, which just does, I think, show me that they're more concerned about you know, being regime friendly they're they are, um, you know, culturally left because I think they think if they play at politics long enough and they play by the rules that eventually the corporate media will, okay, you, yeah, you guys can come in the debates. And, you know, I, I think it's something like that, but, but it is the ad hominem stuff that, uh, that, that they, that they always go to. They never want to talk through the actual merits of what well, yeah. we're saying. And that's my take on the left. The left basically has no good coherent arguments for most of their positions. So the, and they see them failing and, and all their experiments keep failing. And in response to that, their basic tactic is to shut people up because mm -hmm. they, they don't want, they don't want to have to face, uh, you know, examination or criticism. So, yeah, they want to shut people up. But what's and, and it's, it's, it's sad, but not surprising anymore that the left libertarians tend to adopt those talk to adapt adopt those tactics too you know they'll say oh you're a nazi why oh because you you let this guy speak for your group one time so they they'll they'll do the guilt by association thing you know or they will have the least charitable reading possible of what you wrote but they just adopt the taxis to the left and i just i think magnus has done that to a degree here he's done the guilt by association thing and um reading out of content you know when he's challenged on an interpretation of i mean like literally what hoppa said so he quoted David Irving, but it was a it was a reasonable quote. Mm -hmm. So now he's a Nazi sympathizer because David Irving is supposed to be a Nazi, which I don't even know if that's true because I'm not into all this stuff because I'm not obsessed with it. Yeah. Uh, freak. I, I, I think you Irving know. is kind of weird. He kind of either flirts with or actually does their point deny but, some stuff of the Holocaust. But I think that the quote and it, it's linked to, to the article that it's basically saying that historians can. Uh, uh, you know, actually change the past uh, through right. what they do. And so there's actually, I actually see some irony in him, including that quote from someone like from I Irving. Think there may you be know. irony. I mean, but the right, point right. is Hoppe did not approvingly quote uh, a horrible, an obviously horrible thing that Irving said, you know? Um, so is, is now the lesson that you can't ever quote someone who said something bad in another, I mean, it's just this stupid. That's the that's the left tactic. So it's it's right. disappointing. And so when he was called on that, uh, and, and no, and there was another thing. What, what was the other thing that Hoppe said something like, um, after World War II, the America and the West engaged in this propaganda campaign to to demonize Germans as congenital villains, mm -hmm. like basically saying that the German character itself is villainous. And I, look. I, I never thought about it that much, but the more, you know, when I read that, I thought, well, yeah, I've noticed that in my own life. Mm -hmm. You know, Germans are always portrayed as, you know, horrible Nazis and racists and in movies. I mean, by their nature, not just a temporary aberration right. for a few years uh, in the in the 20th century. And and so Magnus characterized that as saying Hoppe, Hoppe says that, you know, uh, Germany was unfairly portrayed as a villain during World War II. It's, just, it's actually just literally – not right. what he said. Yeah. So when he was called on that, he just changed to another critique. He says, well, he said Richard Spencer at the PFS. It's like, okay, but what's, what can you stick to one criticism at a time? And even that, the, as you point out in the article, the, the, uh, uh, Hoppe having Spencer speak somewhere was in 2010, yes. which I think was far before Spencer started out with the racist yeah. garbage. Right. Was. So. I was, I was at that meeting. I met Spencer. I mean, on occasion, Hans invites smart conservatives because it's an intellectual salon and you want to have different ideas being presented. Yeah. Uh, these guys, we we all knew that the two or three guys, Jared Taylor, Richard Lynn, Richard Spencer, they're not libertarians. They didn't pretend to be, and they knew that we were all anarcho-capitalist libertarians, but we all got together to have a, a discussion. Oh, mm. oh, that's horrible now, right? Um, 
And Spencer at the time was he seemed very intelligent. He had this new magazine, which was kind of a glossy, it was like a new chronicles called the alternative right. That was before alt right was shortened to that way, but you know, and I, I did no honestly, I didn't attend all the talks, but I I don't care if someone gets up and says they think uh, one one racial group has a different IQ or women are different. I, I don't care if they have that opinion. I don't care if it's true, to be honest, personally, because right. I'm an individualist and a libertarian, and it wouldn't matter to me anyway. Yeah, you, your 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 views on you know the rights that every human being has is not going to change based on whether you think there might be some. Yeah, it, it, it's it's ridiculous. So. I'm skeptical of the validity of the entire quantitative notion of IQ. I am too. I think as a common sense matter, all human beings have this innate sense. They they sort of know that you know different people have different capacities, and they're yeah. intellectual, cognitive or intellectual related. You know, some people know. Oh, this kid in the family is a smart one. That one's the the dumb one, or or this one's good in arts. And everyone knows this. I don't think you can ever quantify that, and I don't think it's a fixed thing. Uh, it's it, it, maybe it has some uh, uh, sexual or or racial component because your brain yeah. is a physical thing and we did right. evolve differently. I don't know, but it's just a huge diversity. We're all human beings with rationality. That's really all that matters. Now, I guess that my uh, the guys on the other side would you know say, oh, that's the Ayn Rand rationalist in you. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't care. <laughs> this is the good thing about being an independent scholar, like I am. Uh, I. I'm yeah. my own benefactor. I, 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 I'm not. No one controls what I say, so I can't be canceled. One reason I spoke out was it's not about Phil, yeah. but I can't be canceled, and so I'm one of the few people that can't be because cancellation is 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 a big price to pay for some people. So yeah. the, those of us that are lucky not to be cancelable should speak out when we feel like we should. And yeah. you know, I, I feel like Hans was under attack unfairly. Yeah. And some people don't know all the background on this. So I just wanted to put something down in yeah. print that you could refer to, and they could see that, hey, there's at least a, a different side to this. There's a, there's a, yeah. that's all. And, and I want to get into a deep dive on some of the uh, hoppy and stuff that, that does come up that, you know, is used as a, you know, brick bat against uh, us. But then, you know, they never, again, when you want to talk to them about specifics, they, they can't do it. So we're going to do that here in a minute, but I thought it was interesting. Um, I don't know if it was in one of the responses directly to Magnus or, you know, in your, the, the article kind of commenting on the exchange, but it is kind of odd. And I think it's very instructive that a lot of these uh, techniques that do happen in the libertarian world of, you know, using the magic word of racist or, or Nazi or fascist or something like that. Um, and reading it into, you know, between the lines of, of what people are saying, and you're relating that to, I just finished reading James Lindsay's uh, Cynical Theories book, and he, and he talks about sort of the postmodern, applied postmodern technique of, oh, let's interrogate this text. Let's see what they really mean, you know. And so I think it's interesting that, you know, one of the great, you know, uh, uh, anti-libertarian movements, pro possibly the biggest of our lifetimes is, is this applied postmodernism stuff and their main uh, offensive tactic and even defensive when you think about it is to, Oh, let's, Oh, it, it's to play these language games. Well, he said that, but he actually means this that's proof that he actually means exactly the opposite. So that's why it gets so frustrating that uh, not only are they, you know, maybe a little more moderate and wanting to play respectability politics, but they're going to this, incredibly damaging intellectually dishonest technique of oh i know what you mean but you don't know what you mean you know right and uh, you know you can have a debate about whether hoppe is influenced by habermas and the frankfurt school okay but to literally accuse a fellow libertarian mm -hmm. as being a nazi sympathizer you, you i mean you need evidence for that kind of charge and yeah. I mean, Hoppe has written his whole life ever since 1980, the early 80s. He's he has been a steadfast and hardcore anarcho-capitalist opponent of all forms of statism, including fascism um, and Nazi uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, I mean, you know, his book in 1988 or 89, The Theory of Socialism and Capitalism. Two chapters on setting out the definitions, and then the next four chapters are different types of socialism that he bashes. Mm -hmm. 
it's the socialism Russian style, which is like communism, uh, then the socialism of conservatism, which is fascism, yep. and uh, socialism of, of social democracy. Um, so he basically attacks all forms of socialism. I, it, the idea that he's a Nazi sympathizer is like literally insane. Right. And I think that the comment uh, you mentioned about him saying, you know, that this, uh, uh, I, I think he called it character washing or cult there's a German word for it yeah. of what happened and that we still see today in movies and popular culture and stuff of the Germans being these, you know, you know, uh, evil uptight, you know, sadists or whatever, like, just think like, you know, his parents, I guess, were in that generation. And just think if you're a normal person, a party like that takes over your country um, and, and then everybody thinks you're this way. And then, you know, that basically I think their government kind of goes along with some of that stuff to like basically all Germans are equally responsible uh, for this. Like to me, that that's heartbreaking that. If that happened to oh. my family, uh, it's well, ridiculous. Yeah, well, not, yeah, not only that. Look, in America, us libertarians, maybe not all the left guys, but you know, we're, we're kind of we're, we're kind of fed up with the the racial bullshit. Like, um, you know, if you're a, a normal white guy in America and you have a white child, you're supposed to feel guilty. Or it's like, come on, mm -hmm. I'm trying to raise a kid here. Do I need to like give him a guilt trip for the color of his skin? Right. Well, that's pretty mild. Compared to imagine what it's like even today being like a German parent our age with a kid, you know they're going to get the jokes. I've talked to my German friends, Guido Holzman and others. They they live their lives like this, like being mocked and teased and like kind of dark jokes about them being secret Nazis. Uh, I think it's true. There was a character wash. Now, you could argue that part of it was justified in the sense of – you know, trying to assign some culpability for the war and all this, but but it's just ridiculous to say that Germans are congenitally villains, and right. that's all Hoppe disagreed with. Now, you could argue he was fighting against a straw man, and that's not really going on, but that's just an intellectual disagreement. It doesn't mean he's a Nazi sympathizer. Right. <laughs> it doesn't mean he's saying Germany wasn't the villain in World War II. Yeah. So let's – two of the big things, again, that uh, the, the Hoppe critics uh, think are, are going to be their – you know, tools to, to take him down and the Mises caucus down is, uh, uh, I guess two of the big ones are, uh, immigration and monarchy. You want to pick one of those and talk about his, uh, his views on, on that? Sure. Let's talk about monarchy first. So yep. basically Hoppe, because he's not an American, like, so he came here as a fully formed Euro European, um, but as a radical Rothbardian and anarcho capitalist, but he's not sort of like he wasn't raised to fall in love with the Constitution. Like, we're like most Americans are brainwashed into all this founders' worship and the Constitution work, but even the Libertarian Party and the Libertarians in the past, you know, the simplest symbol of the Libertarian Party used to be the Statue of Liberty. You know, we always talk about the Cato always talks about the Constitution, like it's a great thing. Um, so Hoppe just came in with a fresh perspective, it was like, you know, <laughs> The Constitution in America was a centralizing coup. It was not a good thing, and because he's European and he, he's familiar with history, he can see the grand sweep of recent history in the last few hundred years is that um, you had this ancient regime of monarchies, and then around World War I, they all started imploding because of World War I, partly because of America's entry into World War I, making it this big high holy war. Yep. Uh, Hoppe talks about this, by the way, in detail in his uh, in the introduction to his democracy book, which I highly recommend recommend as, as a as a as a um, as a standalone reading. And by the way, on the topic we were talking about earlier about left libertarians, I, I want to also recommend I was just re-listening to this. There's a great lecture by Jeff Deist at when he was at the PF, the Property and Freedom Society about three years ago. Um, it's on our podcast feed. Go to propertyandfreedom.org. It's on the zeitgeist libertarians, but he explains exactly how futile it is for these guys to try to curry favor with the left and with the establishment. They're never going to accept us, so let's stop compromising our principles You know, to be part of that. right? Yeah. But in any case, Hoppe's – so Hoppe's take was that um, um, the conventional wisdom among libertarians is that now, like the Randians, the objectivists, they actually almost viewed the original founding of the U.S. as, yep. a, as a near libertarian utopia with just a few things to correct. I mean that was the scene in the end of Atlas Shrugged 
when the wise Judge Narragansett was marking up the Constitution to just right. change a few things here and there. But so Ayn Rand, no, I can you, – you can forgive her for loving the U.S. and the Constitution because she came here from freaking Soviet Russia. But still, yeah. she had this – a little bit too much regard for the Constitution and the founders, which I think most libertarian – most modern libertarians do, especially the LP types who were mostly minarchists in the past, et cetera. You know? Rah, 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 Constitution, Thomas Jefferson. Oh, but the truth is you know, women didn't have rights. Blacks didn't have rights. Uh, it was not a libertarian society, and the Constitution was not libertarian. It was a centralizing coup. Yep. So a hundred years later, you know, we enter World War One and we make it a war of democracy and all this human rights bullshit, and that caused us to impose a Treaty of Versailles on Germany instead of having a normal type of, you know, settling down of the war and, and reparations yep. and all that. It was it was so harsh that it gave gave rise to nationalism and Hitler in World War Two, right? So, yep. um. Um, but the point is the dissolving of the democracies – I'm sorry, the monarchies in favor of democracy has been seen by libertarians as a, as progress. Like the world sees it because it's portrayed that way in propaganda, and the reason the libertarians see it that way is because you know most of them admit that democracy is dangerous, but they still think it was an improvement over monarchy. After all, you can vote or something like that, right? right. The Hobbit just stepped in with a uh, – you know, like a, a – a bucket full of cold water to throw on the party and say, "Listen, guys, it's not an improvement. Think about it. You know, you have these temporary leaders who are elected, so they're going to have a short term, a high time preference for what they do. You know, whereas compare compare the way things were under. If you have a good parliamentary monarch, then there's many advantages to that system because the monarch number one is going to rule a smaller country, so you don't have a large central empire, and number two. You know, the monarch's going to have higher time preference because he can, he's going to be a ruler for a long time, can leave it down to his children. So he's going to want to tend to adopt more rational policies about immigration and, and other matters. Uh, and, you know, he can't tax you at 90% because if he does, someone's going to chop his head off. So yep. and there's, there's a central head to go after. So there's lots of benefits to democracy relative to, I'm sorry, to major to monarchy relative to democracy. Um, so it's not, Obvious that it's progress to go from monarchy to democracy, and Hoppe simply pointed this out. He's not in favor of monarchy or democracy, and he explicitly says this. He's an anarchist. He's simply saying that some of the institutional features of, the, of monarchy make it superior to democracy in some ways, and he criticizes Rothbard and Mises for having what he calls a soft spot for democracy. And anyway, it was a refreshing wake-up call to lots of libertarians to at least consider the possibility that maybe – we have been misled, or maybe we've given democracy and the American founders and all this stuff too much um, presumption of libertarianness. Do you know what I mean? And, and he, he's kind of uh, countering uh, something else you mentioned in your article, the the Whig theory of history, which is yes. that everything is, you know, it, it's similar to the, uh, I, I, actually, I, I'd like to hear you explain this. Like, it's kind of the you know, the progressive uh, version of things is like, you know, mankind is progressing to some sort of yeah. great ideal. And the Whig theory of history is a little bit different in, in my right. conception that, you know, it's good that, you know, these liberalizing, you know, classical liberalizing things are happening and, and it is, uh, you know, progressing in a certain way where I think it's, I think Hoppe is saying it's messier than that. And yeah, uh, yeah. I think the Whig theory of history, and I'm not a historian, but you know, it's this idea that, that the present's always better than the past, and there's mm -hmm. always there's always continual improvement over time. Uh, I don't know if that's Hegelian, but like this idea that there's like a, an, an arrow of history and a direction of history and all this stuff, which is kind of I always thought was nonsensical and, yeah. and, and bullshit and and uh, mystical. But um, you have to leave out so much. Like you, you bring up. Again, the the two world wars of the last century, then they explain that away, right? Well, not only that, <laughs> if you're if you have a conservative mentality, then this is anti-conservative because the conservative mentality is that there's something of value in past traditions. Mm -hmm. So it's not necessarily obvious that getting rid of that and supplanting with a new thing is always progress. Whereas the Whig the Whig theory basically is anti-conservative because whatever is here now, the new shiny is always better than the past, right? Yeah. So yeah. So anyway, Hoppe's like, no, it was. So you could argue. Hoppe says you could argue that it was retrogression. But now the the reason he argues this is not to say he's in favor of monarchy. He realizes that it's impossible to put monarchies back into place now, 
and nor would he really want that. Although maybe if we could do it, it would be better than democracy. But still, neither one is ideal, and, and it's not possible. The reason he brings it up is just to highlight intellectually – honestly, the, the whole purpose of him doing this is to, to show the flaws of democracy, right. to wait to open our eyes to the – to the true nature of our current system and why we have such a bad situation is because of, of, of the consequences of having a democratic system. And, and then in doing that, he says, OK, now let's turn to the immigration issue. Basically, he says the whole immigration debate is confused because it's like what should the policy of the state be? But there mm -hmm. shouldn't be a state, and there should be all private property. So in a, in a world with, pure, with libertarian justice and with no state… And no immigration policy, and everything was privately owned. There would simply n never be a question of citizenship or immigration. Yeah, it would be private property rights of owners, and they could invite whoever they wanted to onto their property as long as the person could get there on on roads or whatever, some transportation mechanism that was all private. So this it just would be a non-issue. But he points out that in today's world, given that we have a state, especially given that we have a democratic welfare state with with voting rights and with welfare rights and any discrimination law and public housing and and um, uh, uh, all, all these horrible features we point out, then whatever the state does about its citizenship status and allowing immigration, it's going to end up violating someone's rights. If you refuse to grant an immigrant entry who has an invitation from someone, a citizen… Then your Hoppe calls that forced exclusion, and it violates the rights of the property owner. Forced inclusion. Forced exclusion. Oh, I thought if you're if you operate if you invite somebody in, um, against the wishes of someone here, isn't it your for? Oh no. So the, um, there's two things. I'm, I'm okay. There's there's two things. So okay, if there's an immigrant who wants to come in and he has an invitation from a property owner. And you don't permit that transaction to happen. You're violating the rights, at least of the citizen, because you're excluding someone right. who he's inviting. You're not letting him use his property as he sees fit. That's forced exclusion. Yeah. So, so an immigration policy that didn't allow anyone to come in would be violating the rights of some citizens who want to let people come in. Right. On the other hand, if you allow someone to come in who is not wanted by some people, but they have to associate with this guy because of the existence of – Roads, which allows them to travel back and forth, public roads, government roads, um, and anti-discrimination law, which prohibits employers and neighborhoods and regions from excluding people they don't want to associate with. Then he calls that forced integration. Yeah, His point is simply once you have a state, it's going to violate someone's rights, and it's either going to do it by forced exclusion or forced integration. So then the question is, well, ideally we would abolish a state and have – which is why he's in favor of secession because secession – is a movement down towards the ultimate secession of the individual, which is the anarchist world. Um, but barring secession or anarchy, the best solution would be if the de democratic rulers would adopt a policy that a monarch would adopt because we could predict from economics that a monarch's policies would tend to violate rights of the citizens less on average on whole because he has a more rational mindset because his time preference is lower. That's all. So basically he says, OK, look, I just think that the, the democratic rulers should adopt the policy that maybe a monarch would adopt, and that would probably uh, mean it was doing less harm to the people on the whole as long as it maintains control. And that policy would be something like this. Don't let in people that are going to lower the property value of the country, um, like criminals or whatever, but allow someone in who's got – who is employable and has an invitation from like an employer… I actually think if you just adopted Hoppe's reasonable middle of the road policy for the federal government at the current time in the U.S., you would actually have more immigration. It would just be immigrants who came here who have an invitation. Like they're yeah. basically decent people who have enough social capital to have an invitation from some citizen or an, a job offer from an employer. And so that would be to everyone's advantage. It would be to the advantage of the country, uh, the, the, the the GDP, the immigrant. Yeah. Um, so that's all. Yeah, I think it would be easier too. like uh, if it were easier for people to come back and forth uh, to work and, and take their capital back and forth. I think a lot of people who come, you know, Ill, either illegally or legally, they, they try to want to stay here permanently. It's because um, they want to work here for opportunity. But if it were easier for them to Correct. 
I you know, totally come work for a season or work for a few years and then go back. Like, well, to me, not only that, yeah. So I also, yeah. It's, it's, so if we had more mobility was improved, then yeah, they, why would they want to stay forever? They might just want to come for a season or for a couple of years, but right. they figure, Oh, I, I finally found my way in. I'm going to stay now. Right. Um, or, or we have this stupid thing called birthright citizenship. Um, that is also a big part of it. If we got rid of that, and I don't know if that's legally possible, it's constitutionally difficult, but it, but if, if we got rid of birthright citizenship, that would also remove a lot of the objections to this stuff. Yeah. And of course, the welfare state, too. But we're not going to get rid of the welfare state or birthright citizenship anytime soon. Well, and and I, I also I think there's a, a, a strange thing, not so strange when you look at it, that, um, again, the left libertarians are kind of on the wrong side of this, I think. And I, I, just, I know just from uh, uh, thinking about people like maybe my 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 father or, you know, other sort of traditional conservative type people, the main thing, there's two main things that they don't like about immigrants. And one is that they tend to vote uh, a Democrat. And the other is that they do consume public resources. Now, I, I always thought that if the okay, Hey, you can come, but you can't vote. Your kids yeah. can vote, you know, maybe, uh, but like, I, I think most immigrants would take that bargain, but yeah. the left and again, the, the cathedral and all that would say that would brand that as, as racist because it's funny. They, they talk about, uh, you know, conservatives and, and how they look at, you know, race and immigration, but then they will openly brag. Hey, I, I just saw a tweet from some numbskull the other day about uh, because of all the immigration, wink, wink, legal or illegal that, uh, this person thinks Texas is going to be uh, blue very soon. Um, and so like, w basically when a conservative points that out, Hey, I don't like that. Then you're racist. But when you point it out as a, as a leftist, Oh, isn't this great diversity democracy? Yeah. You know, yeah. it, it's, it's completely wacko. Yeah. 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 Now I must, by the way, I don't necessarily agree with all this myself. I'm just kind of summarize what happens to you. I've written on this um, a little bit, but um you know, as an as a as an anarcho capitalist, who really, I mean, I really hate the the state, especially the American federal government. Yeah, uh, I have a hard time condoning anything that the INS does. Yep. On the other hand, you know, I, I I I do think that if we if we allow mass immigration, it could have devastating effects for liberty in this country in a matter of a generation. But I. I don't know. So, you know, I, I don't I don't think that there's anything wrong with saying the U.S. government has no obligation to grant citizenship to foreigners who move here. Right. Well, I think your solution. Is, yeah. Is, I, is, is, and, and by the way, a lot of the um, a lot of the a lot of principal libertarians in the past have been not for 100 percent open borders. You know, um, yeah. we had a whole Hoppe had a whole symposium issue in the Journal of Libertarian Studies about 15 years ago. And it, there's very few people that are for open borders completely. Like Walter Block might have been one of the few. I mean, John Hospers and Tibor McCann, and you know, they all favor some limits. And that's because the state is here. And once you have a state, then I just think that the, to my mind, the biggest insight from Hoppe's immigration work is that to recognize number one that the policy of immigration of a monarch might be superior to that of a of a democracy. And number two, um, no matter what the policy is, some people are going to be harmed. Yeah. There, there is no, there is no right answer because the state exists and it's violating yep. someone's right. Now, so you have to be an anarchist almost to understand this. So mm -hmm. if you're not an anarchist, then you have trouble. Cause if you're an anarchist, if you're not an anarchist, you're a minarchist at best. Right. And you think yep. there's an optimal government. So you think there's a right law for every situation. So that means you have to think there's a right immigration policy. So yep. you struggle to say both sides are evil because you want to you want to maintain your attachment to this idea that we have to have a government. So and it can't be evil because I'm not evil. I'm not supporting something evil. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, yeah, it's like with like uh, schools and like school libraries. There's been a lot of stuff recently about, you know, this state banning this or whatever. And it's like, well. To me, like I, I don't have kids yet, uh, but um, if I did, like, and I certainly wouldn't send them to public schools, but like me, like 25 years ago, kind of Reagan conservative, I'd be like, yeah, I don't want X, Y, Z taught to my kid. But the 
you know, the lesbian witches who live across the street, they have every, you know, they have just as much right to say what they want their kid to learn and not learn as I do. So it's the fact that we're forcing everybody into this, uh, uh, this pot together that that again, that's where the state causes conflict and causes these situations where there's no, you know, there's no obvious democratic solution and there's no, certainly no libertarian solution as long as the, the, the state's involved. Um, and I, I, I agree. And, and uh, you know, as a as a libertarian anarchist, I almost find these debates about public schools boring yeah. because it's, it's, it's like you're missing you're missing the point. The, the purpose of libertarianism is, is not to give advice on the best way to run a socialist statist government school. You yeah. know, yeah. <laughs> there is no right, there is no right way to run it other than to abolish it yeah. um, is one reason, by the way, I'm com- I'm completely. Uh, opposed to this, uh, um, what do you call it? The uh, like the vouchers, voucher movement, and uh, yeah, you know, it's like, dude, no. <laughs> well, let's let's spend a minute on that because I had Cor- Corey DeAngelis on my show a few months ago, and I, I pushed back on him a little bit just because I, you know, I don't want to, you know, get into a knife fight with my guests, especially when they're coming from a, a good place. But a lot yeah. of those. Uh, people, they, they do say, they, they look at this as a very way to, uh, you know, introduce competition to destabilize and and break down the public's faith in, in public schools and stuff. But like I, the, the, not only the, well, just stick to one thing. The biggest thing I see wrong with that is if the voucher, even though it actually is the, you know, the, the people's money. Right. Like, but the fact that it goes, your taxes go to the government and the government sends out these vouchers or credit tax credits or whatever. Like to me, that's inevitably will lead to the government saying, if you're an organization that takes vouchers, then you have to teach that Heather has two mommies or whatever. This, like is, it, the problem, this is the problem with, with issue, issue coalitions in some cases and with yep. narrow issues. And you basically end up, I won't say selling out, but you're, 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 you're replacing you're replacing you're, – you're putting something other than liberty as your top value. Okay? Mm-hmm. So someone like that would say, well, my value is that parents can have a good family life and a good education for their kids. It's like, well, that's fine, but you're supposed to be a libertarian, right? Mm-hmm. So if what you're suggesting violates property rights and is socialist, then sorry, it's not permissible. Um, the, the voucher system – here, the problem with it as far as I can see – well, there's lots of problems with it, but one is – um, I mean, look, we just sent out a bunch of money to people in this PPP bullshit during COVID instead of instead of, uh, I don't know, food stamps. OK, so we did it more efficiently. We gave them cash. Do you think that 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 undermined their confidence in the state? Right. Oh. Yeah. Now the college students are clamoring for f- debt forgiveness. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. The idea that you're going to hand money out to people and think that's going to undermine it's No, it's going to entrench it, actually, because it's going to basically make everyone have this. What they're going to see over time is a natural, a natural human right, a welfare right to everyone's got a right to have their kids educated, even parents of to go to private schools now. So you're going to number one expand the number of. So I look at like I don't know what it is the ninety percent of kids go to public school now, ten percent go to private, something like that. So basically ninety percent of kids are on welfare. Yeah. So if you go to a voucher system, a hundred percent of kids are on welfare. So number one, you're expanding the number of people that get state handouts yeah and number two you basically just privatize all the public the private schools and are all public schools and you publicize all the private schools you basically turn every school into an agency dedicated towards getting governments provided voucher funds right so and and, and as we all know he who pays the piper calls the tune yeah. so the government's certainly good they're not going to let you give your voucher to you know your neighbor down the street in some co-op it's yeah. got to be an official school. Yeah. That means school that complies with a definition that the state hands out. And that definition is going to say things like to be a school, you can't teach you, you, you can't you you can't misgender people, you know. Right. Yeah. You can't teach Hoppa, you can't misgender people. Yeah, you can't so all these private schools are going to lose their independence, at least to some degree. So yeah. the voucher system expands welfare expands and entrenches the idea that the government pays for education, expands and entrenches the idea that you have a right to this, this, and it it reduces the independence of the few existing private schools that we have. I'm completely opposed to it. Yeah. 
Yeah, me too. I mean, it sounds good. And sometimes uh, I'm tempted to root for it just because to see, you know, the, see the teachers, teacher union meltdowns and, well, well, and stuff well, like the, that. The, but... the arguments, you know, there's the thing, the arguments against the voucher system by the left are bad. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Like <clears throat> it would be better in terms of competition. So they're wrong about that. It would be better if we got rid of the teachers union. So they're wrong about that. But from a libertarian point of view, there's other objections to it. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. So another, another thing to kind of, bring it back around to kind of the, the big theme that we were talking about, kind of the, the, again, the left libertarian, it's an imperfect label, but one difference I see between, you know, left libertarians, you know, the, the pragmatist LP people, you know, uh, Cato, uh, some of the reason crowd, uh, people like that is, I think they have this, um, in, in contrast to, to Hoppe, and uh, Mises, even, you know, who wanted to devolve, you know, things down, you know, keep states small and, and get them smaller, is that, uh, uh, and, and I used to be kind of like this in some ways, like I became a libertarian around when I was 18 by reading Rothbard, but some of it didn't quite sink in. And I interned at the Cato Institute. And uh, I, I kind of thought, oh, yes, I, I was kind of a, what I'm getting at is a universalist is, Oh, well, we need to take over the government in Washington and make everybody be libertarian and then spread that throughout the world. And if we have one big, you know, these big uh, uh, libertarian empires slowly spread that that's that's going to be good. But like, I think that, you know, there's all kinds of stuff wrong with that uh, practicality being one of them. It, 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 and so talk about that difference between libertarians who think it can come from the beltway or top down versus the the Hoppian decentralized thing. Oh Lord. Um, yeah, that gets into all kinds of complicated issues of strategy. Um, I mean, there is a wide variety of the types of libertarians. Okay. So you could say there's libertarians as defined by just their political outlook. Like you could have this, you know, a truck driver who never says a word to anyone who's totally unknown, who's a libertarian because he believes that aggression is is wrong, right? Right. But he doesn't do anything about it. Um, or you could have a scholar, a libertarian scholar, who basically tries to uh, um, uh, understand and then explain and maybe build on libertarian theory. But it's kind of academic. That's kind of what I do. Um, or you could have an activist, and then the activists try to get things done um, by getting liberty achieved. And they have long-term and short-term strategies, right? And there's different approaches. And I respect them all. I mean, look, some people think that the way to do it is to run candidates for office. That's the Libertarian Party, the political electoral pol electoral political approach. Um, I don't think that's going to likely be successful in an American system without a parliamentary system. Where the, so our, our system has a winner takes all kind of thing. So we tend to have two parties. I don't think yeah. a third party can ever make it in this country. Maybe in, in, in Europe it could, but they're not as libertarian as us. So they won't, won't make it there either. So yeah. um, I don't, I don't blame people for trying though. Right. And some people have the Randian approach of this, like, Oh, we have to just spread the right ideas. And then they get adopted by the top intellectual intellect, intelligentsia and it filters down to the public. And then we're going to have libertarianism. I mean, you know, I think the people that were fans of Ayn Rand's circle, while she was writing Atlas Shrug, thought that within six months of publication of Atlas Shrug, the whole world would be libertarian. So I think that's wrong, but again, I appreciate it. Um, um, and so now, the, so the DC guys, they think that they're trying to infiltrate, you know, academia, some institutions, um, po politics with donations and things like that. But that tends to make you. Um, kind of moderate your views to try to be to try to get invited to more cocktail parties and to get accepted into more things so you tend to you know dull the edges of your views and that means you're less principled you might be more attractive because you're less threatening to some people but that means you're less threatening that means you're not going to get as much done even if you could which you can't now hoppe has his own view um which is that we need to build an intellectual movement um but it has to be intransigently principled. Uh, and also, you know, part of one thing he said years ago, which I always liked, was we have to build up a culture of people that are being willing, willing to laugh at the state, to mock it, to ridicule it. Like they might be able to boss us around for now and put us in jail if we don't pay our taxes. Uh, they might be able to make us wear masks on airplanes for a while, but they can't make us really respect them. So we can always deride them, 
Don't give them respect. Mock them. Laugh at them. Have comedians. So that's another approach. Um, my own approach is, you know, I think I'm, I, I, I lean towards that. I'm attracted to it, although I'm not going to delude myself into thinking we're going to have a victory tomorrow. Right. My goal is just to – I think you, you could also buy your freedom in your own life by just being very successful. Yep. So the more you're successful in your own life, then the more personal freedom you have. So instead of like spending your efforts trying to buy freedom for eight, 8 billion people, you know, buy it for yourself, and then you'll have an influence and effect on people that observe and witness you and that you have influence over, like your kids and your family and your business colleagues and things like that. Um, so that's sort of my approach. And my approach also is that of um, um, Albert J. Nock. It's called The Remnant. Yep. I think it's important to keep developing, understanding, repeating, restating, reteaching libertarian theory and advancing it. So that if things ever change historically in the or in, in the future in a libertarian direction, and which could be for predictable unpredictable reasons, we don't know, then there will be an edifice of thought there for people to turn to to help understand what's going on to and to maybe foster it along. So yeah. that's what I do. I feel like I'm trying to be part of the remnant, associate with good people, build liberty in my own life, and at least fight on the right side of things as society sort of finds its way. Yeah. Um, in this unfree mixed mixed economy world yeah and and w- one thing we're trying to do at the mises caucus is you know we're very much into the remnant thing as far as we want to educate people and keep the ideas out there which is why we advocate for especially when talking about national politics be as bold and you know as ron yes. paulian as possible because again we're not going to elect a u.s senator or certainly not a president anytime soon barring some yeah. you know cataclysmic yeah. uh yeah freak accident yeah right it's it's not going to happen but then the flip side is to do the the lo- on the local yeah. level do issues coalitions yes. and uh candidates with an eye uh with both of those things uh to try to do nullification and try to break up the yes. state from within and i think there's a couple of uh elements that that work in that the in favor of that strategy is one it, you see people people will see well if a little okay uh, we legalized weed here in Knoxville or whatever, and you know the, the 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 city didn't fall to the ground. So hey, little liberty works. That's good. Yes. And also, I, I people haven't talked about this much, and I don't know. I don't think this is original to me, but I think about it a lot. Of I want to ter- be able to somehow turn these craven, uh, you know, rent seeking, uh, low time preference politicians turn them against one another. Like I, I want to get, I want Gavin Newsom to think he can be president of California, right. Uh, to, 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 to do these nullification type things to split right. things up. I think that that has, once some of these people get a taste of, Oh, I could tell the government to, uh, uh, to go pound sand. So therefore I can, you know, have some power. Hopefully that uh, once we start putting some of those wedges in there, that um, it will get used that way. And inevitably, sorry to say, some of the smaller units will be more um, uh, uh, statist, whether yes. the leftist variety or the rightist variety, but you can leave. Like yes. I, I moved from Ohio to Tennessee because I want to be on the right side of the line right. if this thing ever happens. Right. No, I, I, and I think that's all reasonable. It's one reason I joined the Libertarian Party a few years ago, and I'm a supporter of the Mises Caucus. I like the new idea. Like it's recognized that the presidency is not – Look, our main goal is not to win the presidency because it's it's not realistic. But to at least have a principled, articulate candidate, yeah. messaging, um, and then focus on local and then issue coalitions. All that to me makes sense. And if even if it's an uphill battle, if we can have some victories on occasion or, or change things, you're making a small or maybe medium size or maybe large difference in some actual people's lives. That's a good thing. Yeah, we should always cheer. We shouldn't let perfect be the enemy of the good. So yeah. I'm all in favor of incrementalism and and, and little little victories. Yeah, um, I've about taken a little more time even than I than I thought uh, uh, than I asked for, but I thought I'd maybe ask one uh, question. Uh, I, I see a lot of parallels, uh, and I don't know. We could have another hour's conversation on this, but I I don't want to uh, go that direction. But I see a lot of parallels. Uh, also Tom Woods is another guy that, uh, the same people who attack, uh, Hoppe, uh, attack Tom Woods, uh, uh, you know, Ron Paul's another one too. Um, what should, um, 
what should we do in response to that? I don't think we talked too much about that. We kind of knocked down some of their arguments and exposed them for what they are. But but how should uh, uh, we respond as libertarians and activists when we see people who I consider to be leaders and giants of the movement, you know, Ron Paul, Hoppe, Tom Woods, people like that? What uh, what should our response be? Should we be, engage on this? Should we just keep doing what we're doing? Um, well, op- opinions vary. I, I, some people suggest ignoring this, right? Just ignoring people like this. And probably that's a, that's a good thing to do sometimes. Um, in my case, I felt like I should at least write something once and set it down for people to consult later. Mm-hmm. So I do think you, I think people shouldn't be you, sh- you should be aware of when you're being bullied. Yep. And if you, if you if you have the ability to stand up to the bullying, stand up to it. You don't have to be rude. You don't have to be as contentious as I am, but you can at least refuse to refuse to concede. Um, you know, on don't give in to their loaded questions and then their assumptions. You know, um, I don't know. I just think you should always be in favor of truth and principles and justice and integrity and honesty. And also loyalty to people that you know are good people. I mean, they some people just deserve a defense. Yeah, imagine that. Be a good person to your friends and tell the truth, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah how radical. <laughs> um, yeah, I, we better say goodbye. Uh, it's been too long since I've had you on. We'll uh, do that. Do it again sometime soon. But I, I wanted to give you a chance to talk about. Uh, uh, I don't know if you. I, I assume you want to talk about this, but you, you're going to be doing something here over the next couple of weeks, and so. Tell us what you're doing in the near, oh, I'm heading to, uh, near yeah, I'm, and short term. Yeah, I'm heading tomorrow to Turkey for Hoppe's uh, Property and Freedom Society conference. So I go to that most years. Yep. I did find the ringtone, too, if you want me to play it for your Yeah, listeners. go ahead. Hold it up to the street. Crush the anti-fascist mob. <laughs> That's my ringtone, which I can tell you my wife doesn't love. Especially if it goes off in the grocery or something. That's like the that, point. Right? Yeah, we're, <laughs> we're, we're at a restaurant and this crusty anti-fascist mob thing comes on, and my wife's like, "Stuff and please. yeah, yeah." We'll uh, we'll have links to a lot of the stuff we mentioned today. decentralizedrevolution.com dot com slash eighty seven. Uh, where can people connect with you, Stefan? NS Kinsella on Twitter and stephankinsella.com dot com is my website. All right, it's been a pleasure having you on. Thanks, man. And there you have it. I'd like to thank Stefan Kinsella for his time and wisdom and for clearing up a few things. Uh, There is a link to his article, uh, the article that uh, prompted this episode, as well as some other things we talked about over at the show notes page, decentralizedrevolution.com slash 87. Thanks to my co-producer, Simon Kalpin, and thanks to Dave versus Goliath for all the music you hear on Decentralized Revolution. And as always, thanks to everyone who subscribes to our email list and gives to Mises Pack. Uh, you can do both of those things over at TakeHumanAction.com. And thanks to everyone who, if you would, take some time out to share, rate, review, subscribe to, all that good stuff, Decentralized Revolution, uh, over on uh, YouTube, Facebook, or on your podcatcher. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.